<clears throat> so, Buck, this is your first uh, summer at, in Kansas. How did it go? Uh, it's like I brought back uh, six. Um, I got 13 right now. Uh, so they're splitting in that. So I've got, what is it? One, let's see here. Nine of them are, are, uh, double deeps. And then the rest of them are, uh, five over five nukes. I got them up to three high. Um, so I may try to win them over there. And then, uh, I think I'm going to try, uh, the single brood chamber management next year. So I'll probably split all those and requeen those and go for a try single chamber, at least on some of them uh, next year and see how that goes. So not too bad. Or is the actual beekeeping though much different than in North Carolina? And I think it was in North Carolina, is that where you Yeah, North asking? Carolina, no, um, no, the, the stuff's not, um, the stuff's not, uh, Stuff's not too different. Um, it's just, you know, honey takes a lot longer to dry out because the humidity is so much higher. Like, yeah. I mean, that's that's something here. Like, all my supers are, I think I got a pool. I checked uh, yesterday. There's one that still needs to get below 18%. But I'm going to pull those in two weeks, you know, in, um, in two weeks. But sometimes it would just take forever because just all the humidity in the air. And then we only had about a month of dearth, but like I said, our, our winter time or like it didn't, they, there's possibility they never would shut down. So mites could be a huge issue because we don't have like maybe one or two weeks of um, like what I would call cold weather, like a possibly freezing temperatures the rest of the time. It, it was, you know, they were flying for the most part, but if it never got that cold, we had one mile winter and it was, I mean, I had swarms in March because they just never really shut down. And then mites were a huge issue all the rest for everybody all the rest of the summer. So. But it's now it's just trying to figure out what's coming in and like what's going out and, you know, like what new pollen sources are coming in and just what fawn is out there that I'm not used to. Yeah, you're in for a treat. <clears throat> Yeah, I was uh, trying to get my uh, treat mite treatments on. They're 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 pretty low, except for I got one kind of raising high. I've been trying to get them on by the middle of the month. Is that too late, too early, or too late here? To, to get? Middle of this month is fine. Okay, got it. Because I know I'm, I'm I know I'm losing about at least probably a month that I'm normal to. Because I could feed all the way up until you know late October for the most part. Yeah. You probably go broodless. By the end of October, middle of October, we'll see. It's been a different year. I can't really tell you what's going to happen. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know they talked about like silic acid um, on the last meeting we had, and, and just so everybody's own ed education here is, I was reading somewhere that the first freeze, if you treat within a few weeks after that, that's probably the most blue, broodless period your, your colonies are going to be after that first freeze. So just kind of keep that in mind within the first couple of weeks after that first freeze. Well, it could happen <clears throat> either in November or December or October. Yeah, I'm, I'm by, I remember uh, sometimes I'd go uh, trick or treating in short times of the buff at all. Just well, I've got uh, one and a half minutes after seven. Um, we've got uh, thirty people on. So um, if we'd like to get started, um, we don't have all the officers. I know Jolie just said she wasn't gonna make it, um, but we do have a good panel. Becky here, Cheryl Burkhead. Um, who else I see? I saw, I think Chad Matthew, Gilliland. Matthew Brandis. It's good Matthew help. Matthew Brandis. And so great opportunity if you everybody yeah. can at least get one question and I did not get any um, questions ahead of time by email or text. So we are um, winging it and open. I have a few. I have a few questions for us. So let great. me share, let I even typed them up. I followed your example and did a little PowerPoint with them because that's cool. so handy. Let me see if I can share my screen. 
and I'll see what we can come. They were they were actually sent to Cheryl, and then Cheryl uh, passed them on. So hang Great. on. Great. While you're doing that, Becky, I'll just go ahead and make the announcement that our Monday meeting is supposed to be in Lawrence, in person. Um, we will try to do um, um, Zoom as well, but we're not sure how that's going to work. Um, we also have the Kansas Honey Producers Value Added meeting on the 15th. So it's only um, you know, a little less than two weeks away. Other than that, we're ready that's for questions. That's an exciting um, meeting. Rhea Carlson, who is not a local person at all, is going to talk about, uh, we'll talk, we'll mention this again, the beehive is a medicine cabinet. And I think that'll be really exciting for us all. Um, I think we need to be aware. I, we do a thing at the Shawnee County Parks and Rec. And we have been warned, Stephen, I've been warned that they may be changing their policies to more stringent again. And if that's the case, that, that it, it could happen and it's like, okay, and now we can only have 50% of capacity in the building and which um, might make it hard to use that building 21. We'll just, we'll just have to go with the flow and see what happens. I sure hope not. I, I don't want that to happen for any of us. So, okay. I tried to share my screen. Can we see that? Yes. I can see it. Awesome. So, First question is from Bill Warns, Warns, and he says, let me shut that down. It appears to me that nectar sources for the bees are exhausted, like white Dutch clover included. What, if anything, should be done for food supplement for the bees? I could hear the TV, so shut the door, sorry. Um, Cheryl, what do you think about this? What's going on? What, 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 come on, Cheryl. I think I know you were going to call on me. It's because I love you. <laughs> um, but her source isn't exhausted. What? What did you say? Your source is not exhausted. My sources is, are not exhausted. Yeah. Um, and typically, for most people, I'm not sure that their sources are exhausted yet. Not to the point that you'd need to feed, but I mean, you can certainly go in and evaluate your hives. But if you're having to feed now, there's something else wrong, <laughs> in my opinion, or you got a weak hive that something else is going on. I mean, if, if you, you know, did a, um, a nuke late, I mean, I don't know, even my nukes are boiling over. So yeah, I just can't imagine you'd need any food supplement. And I don't even suggest supplemental feeding until what, October, late October. Um, if you need to fatten them up, you can give them a two to one and feed them until they won't take it anymore. So. We yep. may not have Dutch, but honestly, we're just coming into sunflower and aster and yep. our our fall sources, so. You can get a little bit of a flow off asters. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're bringing in honeydew in some places, which isn't a nectar source at all, but mine aren't, thank goodness. But yeah, we're not done. The, um, I just started to see the first of the sunflower early stuff um, just the other day, so. Yeah, the sunflowers in Western Kansas are just now starting to bloom out. Yeah. Yeah. What's the what's the pollen on the uh, sunflower? What's the color of the pollen on sunflowers coming in? Yellow, typically. Yellow. Okay. I'm just going to throw it out there. Isn't it normal for us to go through some sort of dearth between the spring and the summer? Yeah. I'm not seeing it <laughs> yet. It, well, it may be in the north yard, but I'm not seeing it anywhere else. When we pulled honey today, we had one hive 
that we felt like had probably removed some honey from one of the honey supers that only one of them most of them had honey supers that were just really really heavy but one had one super that seemed lighter than it should have been and we speculated that maybe they were pulling some honey back out of there after all they made it they can pull it back out if they want we had some of that this year in the weirdest time you know yeah. in in the middle of summer when you'd never have it i had some that were doing that but it's kind of like since that hot humid weather they ramped back up no well, idea. I think your first advice, Cheryl, was the best is that you need to get in and look. And if if you have a starving hive at this time, probably lots of things to consider. But I would I would be surprised. Uh, we have had years where we had hives that almost at the 4th of July were we were in such a drought that it was horrid. But this year I would be very surprised. So moving on. When should treatment for varroa mite be scheduled? And parentheses, and yes, I watched Dr. Wu's presentation and I know it should be after there is limited root. I think that's not exactly what Dr. Wu said. I think she said that if you are using oxalic acid, that it works best when there is limited brood, that it does not kill mites under the cappings. And so she was not saying to put off your mite treatment until you have limited brood. She was saying that particular treatment works best when there is limited brood. So yeah, I think your first thing is, you do you need to treat and how badly? We all need to treat this fall, but how badly? Robert, what would you... What, what uh, are you recommending on mite treatments? Uh, let's see. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to jump in while he's. Using. I'm going to jump ahead. in while Robert, while you're thinking. Um, so I did some mite washes today. And I had threes and fours, but I had one colony that's an eleven. So uh -huh. obviously, it's going to need an immediate treatment. So my question tonight was going to be sort of along what should I treat with now um, versus, because I can't wait, I'm, I can't wait on that hive, I'm going to have to do something. Yeah, so what are you able to treat with? That's the question. Uh, Apigard or Apivar. Right. I, I see Cheryl put on some Apigard on some of her hives. I don't know that, you know, I don't think there's a temperature issue with supposedly with Apigard, but I mean, being thymol, I feel like if it gets too warm, that's going to agitate. Yeah, the, so. there is a little bit of an issue with temperature. If it gets too hot and you're using too much, you could cut it down some. So I was thinking about on this particular hive using Apivar, but I don't know what what people. I've not used it before, so. And I, um, it's been a long time. So if anybody else wants to jump in. Well, haven't we seen some resistance with that before? Yeah, I was going to mention uh, that yeah. um, multiple uh, uh, commercial guys had some pretty serious breakthrough with the use of Apivar strips last year uh, to the point where they had uh, 35 to 50 percent uh, losses and uh, uh, that's uh, pretty significant. I do believe that uh, we started to see a buildup of resistance to that. And I know that the company has reviewed that and they're looking at, you know, potentially, uh, you know, doing a uh, reformulation of the product. But, uh, you know, anytime that happens, it's going to take, uh, you know, at least a year or more for them to uh, go through that process and, and to, uh, you know, get that completed and get it back out on the market. So, uh, but uh, um, I, I, that's what I've seen so far and what I've uh, been uh, privy to and what I've heard. I really like the Apigard, Matt, but I, it's really critical the first couple days that you apply that, that the temperatures be a little bit uh, cooler. I mean, you can even put it on in the 90s, don't get me wrong. You can go to 105 degrees with it, but I wouldn't encourage it. Um, but if you're gonna have, you know, 
couple of days where it's cooler when you first apply it, that's always best. So, you know, maybe under 90 degrees. I put it on when it's in the low 90s. If you put it on and it's too hot, you can actually have them um, um, kill, they'll take out brood, they'll destroy brood on you. You'll find they're kicking out brood out the front entrance, which you really don't want them to do. You can put it on half strength. Um, I don't usually do that, but you know, um, so I put it on when the temperatures were in the 80s. Um, it's going to ramp back up to about 90 by the weekend, but we have, you know, less humidity and cooler temperatures. They'll be fine. They'll, you'd be surprised how fast a strong hive can actually get out of the hobby. So there probably won't be any in, but. So Matthew, oh. you are talking about a hive that does not have a honey super on it. We're not we're not trying to deal with anything while you're while you've got them supered. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I've already I've already pulled mine. Yeah, I've got a few that have supers on, but they're not really doing anything with them. So, um, yeah, no, this would be a superless a superless hive. And Rob, I, would you yeah. use oxalic acid at even at this early juncture on the one that's with the high count or not? You know, if that's what you're planning to use, at least to get a knockdown. Um, of course, you can't expect it to, you know, take care of the brood part. But if you're looking for a quick knockdown, at, you know, in an emergency situation, and you're going to use something else later on. <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of what I feel like now. I need to do with that high, that high of a count that I need to really yeah. get them in check now. I can't wait till later on. Realize that. Uh, most of those mites will probably be in the field brood already. Right. So, and I don't need mites on my winter bees. I learned that lesson last year. Yeah. And that's the difficult part too. Like uh, well, when we talk about all these things, even like using Apigard, we're talking about 10 frame, 8 frame colonies. You really, in this hot weather, when it's hot and warm, it really drives them out of the nukes. So that's a whole different story. Okay. All right. So part three of Bill's question was, what, if anything, should be done to encourage healthy bees going into fall? And Bill, as far as I'm concerned, that is dealing with Varroa. And if you don't deal with Varroa, then there's just, they're just not going to be healthy. But maybe other people have some other health tips for their bees going into fall. Um, Who do we have on here that would like to, I saw Joe Pat, do you have anything that you'd like to contribute? I think I saw your name come up. I'm not able to see people participating very easily. Uh, Becky, I'm, <laughs> I kind of forgot about this and I'm walking the dog and just listening. So I'm, but I'm not really paying much attention. I'm sorry. I'm just shocked. You and your dog have a good walk. <laughs> That's awesome. We're, we're almost back home, but I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no That's problem where heavy at all, breathing Joe. Is coming from. That's where all the heavy breathing's coming from. <laughs> Joe's out exercising. That, that's cool. You and your dog. That's that's a good thing. So anybody else have some little little things that they always try to do to help yeah. their bees be healthy in the fall? Yeah, if you got a felling queen, you need to take care of it now because it's not oh. going to get better. If it, it's not going to get better in time. This is your 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 that window's closing to get either get a queen mated, you get a mated queen, or do it on your own. But if it's uh, if you have any doubts, if you know, get rid of her. Great, great tip, Buck. That's that is, and kind of along those same lines. If you have a hive that has failed to thrive and little tiny bitty hive, one of the things we always do in the fall is. Uh, we don't we don't try to winter over little bitty hives. We pick the better queen, combine it with somebody, making stronger colonies. But that's that's for sure. That's a great tip. Okay, well, Bill, thanks for the for the conversation. And it if Bill, are you on here tonight? I did not see him. No, well, I'm here. I'm here. I just. I was a little late, but I, I heard, so. Well, good, good, 
Well, I hope that that helps. I hope we answered most of your questions. Anything that you need clarified? Um, since I got on a little bit late, did someone comment about whether it's it's the time to start giving them a supplement? If because I don't have anything on my property that that except for my cucumbers that they can get nectar from. Well, you really need to look at that two mile circle. And we were talking as a group about how we're really surprised if you're having that strong of a dearth. We're right now on the edge of sunflowers and asters and our good fall floral sources. You need to get into that hive and see what's actually in there because if they're starving right now, you probably have something else going on and maybe that should be it there right at this point in time most of it nobody said oh i'm feeding my bees because unless it was an extremely late swarm or a little bitty nuke you got late or a split or something that that you know started late did i paraphrase that cheryl uh-huh Okay. Well, thank you. That's very good. Now, what I did give to them was a lot of a lot of honey from last year because I lost my hives, but I had a lot of honey. And uh -huh. so they've got a lot of honey in their hives that I gave them. And uh, that answers my question. So I guess I better get into the hive and do what you said. And uh, and the other thing is that I watched Dr. Wu last last time. And I think it's a little early, isn't it, to be doing anything with Varroa mite? Well, uh, yes and no. If you, uh, Matthew Brandis talked quite a little bit about he has a hive that he was doing mite checks on. And he saw one that has 11. His mite count on his mite check was 11. And mm -hmm. so we were talking about appropriate treatment for that now those that kind of numbers you don't want it to go any further because right now our bee populations are going down and so the number of mites per bee ah. is going up so yeah if, if you've got high numbers take care of it but i think robert don't you aren't you the labor day person if you you need to be thinking about treating about labor day that's my goal every year is to try to yeah. get get my hunting started for sure I'm taken off by Labor Day and that's what I tell other people especially hobbyists I've got a few more hives and sometimes it takes me a little longer but I'm kept pulling honey starting this week and my goal is to get done by Labor Day and start my my treatments and treat yard by yard yep yep sounds good okay thank, I thank you everyone thank you Okay, this is from Dan, and I think I saw that Dan is on here, and Dan says, I have a super on my hive that's about 70% full as of two weeks ago. Should I wait until September or October to extract the honey or do it now? Um, Chad, are you still with us? <laughs> I can't even see anybody, so I'm just like in the dark here, so. Come on. There he is. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Sorry, I had some uh, conversation in the background. No problem. So, what do you think? Extract when you've got a super that's seventy percent full, and that was two weeks ago. My thought is check now because it might be full <laughs> you never well, know and, yeah i mean what i've seen um you know things can turn around on a dime and uh you know where you know last week or a week and a half ago things seemed to slow down um we've seen an uptick in uh, uh you know resources coming in so it can things can change very quickly um you might have a uh rain event in your area that helped to boost uh, the floral source um, you might this cooler weather um, can sometimes you know have uh, uh, have you know you know help and assist in uh, you know changing the dynamics of uh, foraging um, so yeah I would definitely check 70 percent full first off I guess I would check my moisture content um, just to make sure that uh, 
it's going to be at an acceptable level of 18.6 or below uh, for, uh, you know, the, uh, the, just the quality of the honey that you don't have, you know, the fermentation process. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, if you, uh, if you leave it on, the one thing you have to gauge that against is, you know, what, uh, what are your might, uh, concerns and what are your might issues? Cause you know, in our area, you know, the concept of get your first treatment on okay. by, uh, the second I'm going to go to Aldi is, uh, kind of a, a rule of thumb that I've always been taught. So, you know, we, we, we take that under advisement and take that under consideration. When yeah, we're, uh, we need, I guess we that. need. Sorry about that. She keeps unmuting herself and I'm trying to keep her muted. <laughs> Go ahead, Chad. No problem. Did that, uh, did that uh, answer, uh, answer your question there? Dan, if you want to chime in on that, you're welcome. I'm going to have to make here. Yes, it uh, it does. I I will say that um, Becky, I sent you another email today, and actually I checked the uh, super, and I was incorrect. Um, I said it was about seventy percent full two weeks ago. Actually, it was about fifty percent full when I checked it today. Um, I think I over exaggerated to be quite frank, but so I guess my question is now with 50% full, uh, should I wait till September, October to extract the honey? I definitely would. At that time, you're not going to hurt anything by leaving it on the hive. And so up until that time when you're ready to do, uh, I need to treat for mites, I need to get, the, you know, if you should say, I need to treat for mites now, take it off. You can throw it on a different hive. You can, this one's got just some honey in it. I'm going to put it over here while I treat, do some things like that manipulations, but there's no reason to. We will do our last honey pull just about the time we have first frost. And we, you know, that's, it, it, it varies. It varies from year to year and hive to hive. And you kind of learn to look at that and what you're going to, this hive's still working, this hive's not, but um, yeah, I, I think you'll be fine, Dan. So I would leave, I would definitely leave it. We have another question about honey supers that maybe I think it's too over. We'll get back to that. So thanks, Becky. Thank you. Thanks for contributing it. So this is from James and James said a beekeeper here in Atchison County is preparing to move to Florida and he wants to take his bees with him. Should he have the health of his bees certified before he moves? If yes, who is the proper authority to do that? Anybody got an answer to this? Yeah, well, first of all, no. he needs to check. He, he needs to check, because I just got done doing this. He needs to check if Florida requires you to have an inspection coming into the state. Exactly. And, and once that's if that's a yes and i believe there's a thing on the agricultural website to get it done because i was checking if kansas needed it to come into the state um, but they did not need it coming into the state so kansas does not have an apiary inspector this week on thursday steve and i and a couple of kansas beekeepers are going to go talk with a guy named mike beam who is the kansas secretary of ag and we're going to go talk about honeybees listed as a as specialty livestock. So when Kansas Ag looks at honeybees and what we do with them, they think we're like goats. That's it, we're goats. Llamas, goats, peacocks. Yeah, that's what we are. So we really wanna to talk to Mike about the value of bees. And I understand that K-State has just recently hired somebody that may be the person to fill that niche and I could not I looked for their name could not find it so I'll have to get back with people on this but I think it's going to be somebody that's in a similar role to what Gary Ross was back when he was our apiary inspector somebody who is going to be plants mostly plant disease identification, but we'll also do some things with honeybees. I guess I want to know what their qualifications are, where they're at, what they're doing. But 
my advice to James when he talked about this was talk to his ag extension agent because we have two things going on here. He's the person that would help direct you if there is that person available. And second, letting people know we have need. If we don't continue to say we have need of an, of an apiary type, inspector type person, they'll just go, oh yeah, well, bees aren't really important in Kansas and we don't need to know about that. So that's one of the things we're gonna talk about when we uh, go visit with Mr. Beam this week. I'll let you know how that go, works out. I think- um, Becky. So Becky, I just did a quick Google search. Um, yes, Florida does require a certificate of inspection on all shipments moving into Florida from outside the state. This certificate is to be issued by the state of origin. So Good. I guess the, the bigger question is, is who is that in the state of Kansas? We don't have anybody. <laughs> so they don't need it. I'm joking. Well, yeah. Cheryl, did you have a comment? Uh, the sad part of my question is that I, it was the county agent here in Ashton County who asked me, where do you get bees inspected? He doesn't know. Awesome. That's so good. That's <laughs> just... <laughs> okay. I will try to get back with you, find the name of this new person that's with K-State. It's going to do plants and hopefully do a little crossover into bees. That's what Mike made it sound like, this Mike Beam, that there would be somebody that was going to at least fill that role partly. But they, they have admitted they do not really have an apiary specialist. That's why we do so much with the University of, of Nebraska, because they do and we don't. So um, yeah, we'll get back to you on that. I, when I, I answered James by email, Jim Kelly, I know, has dealt with this before, and he will help you uh, traverse this if nobody else will. I can't remember who Jim used to say that looks here in Kansas. But Jim really, says what? What I can't remember what Jim Kelly used to say for, for who inspects here in Kansas, and they really don't know anything about bees. They're just looking for anything gro gross, grossly wrong. <laughs> Um, well, Sharon Dobish did a little bit, but yeah. she's not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. And Raymond Cloyd, I believe, may have filled yeah. that niche a little bit, yeah. but he's really not a bee expert. He's a chemical uh -huh. expert. So, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Specialty livestock. So from Facebook, how do you remove bees from supers before extracting? And I'd just like a few people to talk about what they think is the most efficient way to do that. So unmute, chime in, let us know how you, if you've done it this year, what's going on? Nick's smiling. Nick, how do you, Hawkman, how do you, how do you remove your bees from your supers? A leaf blower. Okay. Do you use electric or gas powered? Gasoline. Yeah, that's what we do as well. And somebody mentioned that on the women in beekeeping site today. And there were about a half a dozen women who jumped on that and thought that was the worst thing you could do in the whole world. I kind of went, oh, well, <laughs> been doing it a long time, but okay. Other ideas. I like a leaf blower. We like a leaf blower. So I think part of it to me also is how many hives are you oh, doing, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, if you're only doing uh, well, I don't know what the limit is, but two or three, uh, you know, leaf blower might be a little excessive, yeah, uh, a little abusive, uh, <laughs> you know, and I think also how many people, I, I will tell you the way we've done it is we use, you know, the honey bandit. So with a fume board, we just take a, a little kitchen towel and a few spritzes of the honey bandit and put it on there. And then it doesn't get them all out, but it gets 95%. And then Sandy and I, I just pull a frame out, shake the bees off, brush the ones that are stubborn and hand it to her. And she walks it over to, you know, the empty box and sets it in. And by the time she gets back, I've got the next one. Uh, so we use the honey bandit and a bee brush. Brush and walk, brush and walk. That is a perfectly. But that's, you know, we are way to do it. We yeah. do five or six hives this year and with two people. So that's how we do it. 
Very good. Very good. I think people think that using the leaf blower is extremely hard on the bees. And I will tell you that it surprised me the first when we started doing it. They just are kind of disoriented. They start a little bit. They, they fly kind of in a little circle and they go home. And 15 minutes after you've done that, you can't tell that you've done anything on the hive. So today, one of these uh, little fractious women said that she uses almond extract like you use in baking, puts almond extract on a dish towel, tea towel, and lays it over the super and it acts like one of those repellents that the bees move away from that. Has anybody else ever heard that? So I will tell you that the honey bandit smells exactly like almond extract. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. what it smells like. Yep. The, the, it's kind of a cherry almond scent in, with it's, that and not, and not as good as the um, Bego, Honey, but much better smell. Dawn or whatever that they don't sell smells like that too. I just wondered, just, just plain old almond extract from your kitchen, if that would work. I don't, of course, this site has kind of wacky women on it, so I don't have a clue. It might, might be okay, but it may not be. So anyway, other Becky, ways. Becky, other I, ways. I prefer to use a, uh, inner cover that has a triangular bottom, you know, where you, you can exit, but you can't re-enter. It and takes escape. a day, day and a half to get them out, but I just put it on and a day and a day half later, I come and I take the, the super off and there's no bees in it. Very good, yeah. And that's honestly, if, you're, if you only have, again, have a few hives, I can go back again in a couple of days. It's not a big deal. I can put the, put the, escape on there let the girls walk out and come back and take it off all good all good very good way to do it so if your honey measures over 25 percent moisture what should you do cheryl has done some very creative things what do you do cheryl well if you leave it in the comb it's much easier and if it's uh, uncapped it's easier to bring down, but you can bring it down even if it's capped. But um, I would stack them and put a box fan over them and I would put it in a small enclosed room with a dehumidifier. You have to kind of be careful the smaller the room that you don't get your room too hot. I always like to hear Andy Noah check what he did to his supers. He used to talk about how he melted one. He got it so warm in one of his rooms with a dehumidifier on, but in my 24 by 24 um, honey house, I have a single dehumidifier running and I have uh, the humidity down to 31%. And that's a big room. So if you had a smaller, um, like Becky, you have a smaller little room that you could you know, use for um, a dehumidifier room, um, you, can, you can bring that moisture down considerably over several days time, just running a box fan through it, like the bees would do to evaporate the moisture from it and to have it in a room that's, that's a low humidity. So it just takes a little time. If the, you beekeeper, the beekeeper who told me this, my answer to him was leave it on the hive. Yeah. And that. because I just thought this early and that high humidity, you can bring it down a couple of points and it's not too, you know, if you've got something that's at 20 and you want to bring it down to 18, right. but 25 is pretty darn high. I, I was going to ask Becky, I, I flippantly said, check your refractometer. Yeah. Um, oh is, yeah. I mean, 25, I mean, 25 seems really high. Have you ever seen anything that high? I know we've had over 20. But it's, you know, it's 21 not very 20, often. 2021. Yeah. yeah. Never higher than that, usually. You know, yeah, that's I a would, good point. Check your, re get it, borrow somebody else's refractometer, check it out, test it. Yeah. Or get a calibration kit. Yeah. I think you can get calibration fluids for those. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All righty. 
That's it. That's my question. So what do we have in the chat box? I'm going to end slideshow. Robert, have we, you got some questions now? We've got several, but going back, <clears throat> uh, this one just says iPhone 3 says, can I use any honey that is left on during mite treatment? In other words, can I, I guess, can I eat it, the honey after a treating for mites? What and do you treat with? Yeah. It depends on what you treat with and make sure you read the directions, whatever you use, and that you know what you're using and uh, what the active ingredient is. Because there are only a couple um, chemicals that you can use. And um, otherwise you need to pull the honey supers on. You don't leave them on. You know, anybody that's interested in, in alternate treatments really should spend the time and read everything that Randy Oliver's written because he has he is looking at ways to use oxalic acid while honey supers are on he is not there yet it is not approved by the FDA but it certainly is interesting reading and it's it uh, he's a prolific writer so there's a lot of stuff out there to read yeah. Other than oxalic acid, I think the only other one is HopGuard 3. Formic Pro. Yeah, Formic Pro. the Formic Pro and the, so the Formic Acids and the HopGuard 3. Yeah. Too hot in Kansas. Yeah, and, Formic Pro oh, is yeah. too hot. It's usually like a spring or a, a late fall for Formic Pro. It's really good, though, for getting stuff underneath the capping. But like I said, it's, it's temperature. It's temperature dependent. But it yeah. will kill bees. It'll it'll I, do bad things if you if you don't watch those temperatures. For that reason, I don't use formic acid at all. Yeah. It'll it'll send your nose hairs too. First time you use it, Ooh. I tried it once. Nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 strong. Oh man. Yeah, I tried it once. One year. Uh, let's see. So the other question was, same person, I found bald brood today. What should I do? Do a mite wash. Exactly. Mite wash, do a count. There might be other reasons why you may have bald brood. Generally, um, it might be mite, mite issue, but there might be something else going on too. And then Crystal Barkley asked, I have a question about my queen in a super. I am a super, super new beekeeper. So um, Crystal, would you like to add anything to that? Or you're just saying you found a queen in your super? Did you use a queen excluder or not? Most of us recommend using queen excluders. And if you have anything, chime in if you're still on. If you're able to. And I don't see her on, so she might be um, just in on the phone. So yeah. So she's not able to to express anything else, but if you want to type anything else, go ahead. So Robert, I know you're a proponent of Queen Excluder, so that's something that you advocate strongly. Why is that? Um, several different reasons. One, you don't want to extract, pull honey and then find you've got brood in some of those supers and then you have to put them to the side. Um, two, um, I store my supers outside and I, I really don't use anything protection wise. Um, so you, you have to think in terms of what the pests do and the pests that we have that uh, wants to eat that comb is uh, are the wax moths. The larvae are looking for protein. And so every generation that that queen produces when she lays an egg in that cell, they create a cocoon. That's protein for the wax moth larva. And that's what they're looking for. They're more attracted to that than just plain old wax from honeycomb. And so you'll have a lot easier storage <clears throat> um, situations when just not, not allowing queens to go up and lay in your honey supers. So that's a big reason for me. I agree. I agree. Hi, this is Crystal. I hit the wrong button, so I there you go. missed all Good. of that. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to ask you to repeat. I can go back to the recording, but 
Um, I think I heard at the end that um, the larva that's being laid there can be um, protein for the moth, so we don't want her in the honey super. Is that correct? Right. When every when that when that uh, larva create goes into the pupa stage, it spins a cocoon, and that's what turns your comb brown. That's why your okay. brood comb gets dark, and that's right. protein. Okay. So yeah, that's the protein yeah. that okay. goes they're looking for. Well, the okay, cocoon. my um so the person that I bought it from had me add a second super, honey super with 10 frames. I wasn't mm -hmm. able to be there when they added that second super, but they put the extruder in, you know, in between the two honeys rather than the brooder in the two. So, yeah. I thought that looked weird. <laughs> well, it'll be a lot easier um, if you can work those out next year. You know, you can use them this okay. year, but you're going to have storage issues. Depends on what you use, you know, to store them. And there are different ways we all of us store our, you know, supers for protection. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'll do some more research and uh, reach out with more questions. But in the meantime, do I need to try to get that queen back in the brooder and put the excru excluder in the right place? You could if you'd like. I would recommend it. She needs to be. Okay. She needs Very to good. go down there in the brood boxes anyway. That's where she should be. So. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. All right. Well, Very cool. You, you want her laying down there. You want her to, and by putting her down there, the bees will work that area. As she, her nest is shrinking, they'll backfill it with honey. But by keeping her down there, but you could you could just brush all of the bees open the hive brush all those bees off of that super and put them into the bottom and then slap your queen excluder down and the workers will come back up again and the queen will have to stay down below but i'm with robert we don't like brood in our honey supers and i know other people don't care that that's fine but uh, we hear people at the end of the year a lot of times saying, oh, well, they didn't have very much honey in the honey super, so I just left it on. Well, about 100% of the time, next spring, that queen will be up in that honey super, and she will have laid eggs, and you're stuck with that as a brood box forever yeah. and ever, amen. So. Yeah, and she does. She has a few eggs and a few larvae that are up there. I mean, obviously, that's how you know, I, I realized, oh, no, she's actually there. Um, I was reading that it could be because your brood box was overflow, but I, I just, I didn't think it looked right. But so I appreciate that answer. I'll, I'll definitely do some more research and get her moved. Oh, don't hesitate to reach out for clarification. That's fine. No problem. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Veronica Sellers. Um, Veronica Sellers is asking, we are considering oxalic acid vaporization for treatment this fall. What kind of equipment do people suggest and what are sources of this equipment? Question three. Everything got quiet. Because <laughs> we're waiting for you to answer. <laughs> um, oh, well, if I, thank you, I, I'll go ahead and answer. There's. Um, you can, there are a lot of different sources. You might look at OxVap, you can look at Randy Oliver's website. You can um, just make sure you're getting good information and the equipment, you know, I, the last couple of years, I found great inexpensive vaporization wands off of eBay. So um, never thought I'd use that as a source, but yeah, that's, that's what I use eBay for. Um, otherwise, Mostly it's reading and getting knowledgeable about it and learning about what oxalic acid is and where it is in other food resources in our environment and what you need to do to protect yourself um, and look and see how, they're, how they've been using it in Europe too. So that's what I would do. Look at my website. I have a, I have a page information on my arburnshoney.com website on oxalic acid treatment that I put out there when I used it started using it six seven years ago so if you, if you don't want to go with the wand there's a you got the what provap which is like five hundred dollars it goes by quick but there's also a guy on um, b form i found johnny provap it's like 200 bucks same thing as a, a provap does the same thing for 200 bucks it's a lot cheaper than uh 
a $500 pro vap or, you know, the wand works great, but it also is, it's time consuming. Well, it, it, uh, it takes, yeah, the wand is great. It cost me 40 bucks. That's what it was off eBay. I can do a BR to 14 colonies. Um, I have it down and I can get it done in an hour and 15 minutes with the way that I do it. So. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. It's a time thing. With the one thing I bought, I can get my yeah, a size that size done in, in fifteen. But it's just like I said, it's just a it's a it's a time thing of what, what you're willing to pay for. So just kind of whoever is looking at that, just kind of keep that in mind of you know of of how many you got and what you're looking at. Yeah, don't get shocked by what the commercial people would pay for it. <laughs> yeah, that that's why that's why I said that the Johnny Provap is like I said. There's a does does the same thing as that Provap does, and it's it's you know, I think it paid 200 bucks and I've, it's what money well spent, but definitely PPE is also key regardless of which, which one you use. And if you are a fan of YouTube, if you go on the YouTube channel, Bob Binney, just this week, they have a great discussion. It's in three parts. Um, um, Jennifer Berry is on there and a few other people. And that I've only seen the first part and there's part two and part, part three that I have to get to yet, but uh, very good information there. Um, moving on, Emily and Zach, we got a nuke in May. We have two deep brood boxes with brood and capped honey, all frames very full. We added a clean excluder and a honey super about a month ago, but they never drew out comb in the super. Anything we should be concerned about, or is that just the way it goes sometimes? Should we pull the super? Becky, what would you do? That's just the way it goes sometimes. Honestly, yeah. you need to check your brood box. Make sure that there's not anything wrong. Make sure they didn't go queenless. Make sure that, that that's all still healthy. But honestly, a month ago was the 1st of July and our bees are pretty much done drawing wax by then. If you had had drawn supers to put on, they probably would have filled them without too much trouble. We still had flowers then and they were still doing a lot, but that wax drawing is a real finite amount of time. And so I think they probably just won't, but double check the health of your hive. That would be, that would be ours. And I'd pull this, you won't hurt anything by leaving that on there. If it's a strong colony, that's, it's not gonna hurt anything, a little ventilation but we'd probably pull it off pretty quick because we'd want to do our mite treatments and you don't want it on there when you're treating for mites. Thank you guys. All good. May, Matt Waymire is asking, I have one small hive. The queen is a few years old. I, I've never crushed and replaced. Who could I buy a queen from soon? And then how should I do it? Matt, are you sure that queen's been there for a few years? That'd be my first question. <laughs> it seems like with, you know, every year they've probably swarmed and you've got a new queen. <laughs> I see a Christy listed here. Christy, is that, is it Christy Sanderson or is it Christy somebody else? Christy's here, I saw her. It's me. You sneaky person hiding without your last name on there. <laughs> So Christy, what do you what do you think about the queen question? Um, I'm with Bob. I think it's probably not your same queen. It's probably swarmed, yeah, or superseded due to age if they didn't swarm. But if you feel you need to requeen it, um, you know, reach out to some local beekeepers that do some queen rearing, um, or sometimes. Beekeepers.com has queens this time of year in the area. Very good. Yeah. I evaluate the queen. See what see what she's doing. See how she looks. So how are we doing on questions, Robert? We still have a few more. Oh wow, well, there's a lot of messages that have come in. Dave Mur Murphy's asking using three hive bodies. Should I use more than one scoop? of oxalic acid in a vaporizer. And Dave, yes, and you need to probably read up more um, to see exactly how much you should use per, for three hive bodies. It's supposed to be one scoop, one quarter teaspoon per hive body. So that would mean it would be 
three quarters, at least on that. So, um, Shannon Schmidt says she picked up a nuke in June and they filled the first eight frames quickly. At that point, I placed the second deep box on without a queen excluder. They have only filled out four of the frames in the upper. Do I have a chance to get honey this year without a queen excluder and a honey suple? Uh, where do you live, Shannon? Are you in, um, I would say probably, if you're close to my neighborhood, you don't have a chance. But if you're in Cheryl's neighborhood, you probably do. <laughs> <laughs> and Becky, how, how's the flow going in your area right now? Oh, pretty slow, pretty slow. Yeah. I mean, there's still bees putting some stuff in, but boy, last week when it was 100 degrees, I think all they did was find water. So yeah, that, yeah, not not much. Well, you know, I'm treating the north yard, which is the closest I get to you. So my north yard's not doing anything. So treatment's on up there. Isn't that amazing? A few miles difference and can be. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think Jessica you, Martell. If Sorry. you are looking at foundation now, there's just zero yeah. chance that they're going to do much of anything with it. So yeah. um, just short of a miracle. <laughs> yeah, just just think of it as you know, changing gears, moving on to other things, and that's that's okay. Next year will be a better year. Yeah, so here Crystal again. So if you if there's no chance for new foundation and say you put in a frame and you see it's still empty, right? Do you take that frame out and make it a nine frame super and they have more room or do you just leave it in there and let them deal with it? No, you have to leave it until everything is drawn out. You don't want to give them more room because then they get very creative in a naughty way. They do things that you won't like at all. They'll build comb in whack, wackadoo ways. And so until they have everything drawn, you need to keep 10 frames in every box, which seems kind of counterproductive, Perfect. but yeah. All right, well, thank if you. If you're talking about drawn out brood frames, you'd want always have 10. And I know some commercial guys that run with nine, but you're gonna want a full 10 frame for brood frames in your brood box. Gotcha. Robert, going back to Shannon's question, she posted that she's from Lawrence. Okay. Uh, you, Lawrence yeah. in the city, Lawrence North, Lawrence South, East, West. <laughs> if she's close to Cheryl, that'd be Barrington. So there's a good flow going on she there. Might, she might, she actually might draw some out. She's Southwest of Lawrence. Okay. I probably she think Southwest she'd be dry. Not southwest of Lawrence, no. Yeah. All right. Southwest, maybe oh. southeast. Isn't that funny how regional we are? How little regions make such a difference to what's available. Okay, Jessica Martell, this might be interesting. My bees are very few and there are maggots in the cell. Oh. Par apparently the queen is dead and the maggots are eating the dead eggs. And now I, I can tell that it's too late, but I wanna know what happened. And a quick answer, a small hive beetle. Your bees got too weak. That's the other pest that likes protein. And that protein was is um, brood, pupa, and pollen. And the small hive beetles love it. That's how they, that's what triggers them to breed and to lay eggs actually is if they can get into the pollen, uh, the, that'll trigger them to lay eggs. And that's where you get the little maggots from. Not very nice. So I'm sorry, that, pro that hive's probably gone for this year. You may have to read up on about them and start, start better next year. Uh, Sean Emery asked, as soon as I have a honey super drawn and filled, I removed the excluder and I haven't had a queen uh, cross the honey barrier yet. That's probably in re relation to the questions we had earlier in discussion on using a queen excluder. And he also says, I use an eBay vaporizer and it's worked great for three to four years now, thinks it was around $20. Great. 
Um, Andrew's iPhone, how should I we be putting Appagard on for good winter beat? Uh, let's see. Who uses Appagard? Cheryl. Yeah. Anytime. When should they be putting Appagard on for good winter bees? When are you going to get your winter bees? This is the latest, well, this probably be the latest I've been getting on stuff just because I've still got a flow out here. So um, I like to treat in August as soon as the temperature breaks. I like to treat. I don't like to wait till Labor Day. I think if you can get a couple of good brood cycles with them uh, not stressed by uh, mites and the viruses, uh, that those are, are great bees to, to get ready to head into the winter. So. I like to do a couple of brood runs. So I'll try to have mine off here in the next week or two. <laughs> and, yeah. So part uh, of that's understanding when are you gonna when are your winter bees starting to be developed? And so right. in the biology of the bees, it's usually in the middle of September. So when the queen's laying eggs and your new bees that are gonna live live those five, six months are the ones that are gonna be born in September and going you know, after that. So just realize that. <clears throat> um, let's see, question. I think that's it. Just a comment on there. Matt Buck Bradley gave a link to a YouTube on um, uh, vaporization related to oxalic acid. And then Shannon said she's from Lawrence. And um, that's it. Yeah. Before we take off tonight, uh, mm -hmm. Cheryl, do you know what the program is? Or maybe Christy, Christy's on. Christy can tell us. Christy, what's the program for I August? I have here too, but Christy, if she's there, she can say what it is. Um, it's going to be Andy Nocek. He's going to talk to us about extracting honey. And then we're going to have a first 15. And Jolie Weiner's going to do... Um, show how to do a powdered sugar mite test to see what your mite levels are. And this Very is good. our monthly meeting in Lawrence at the program. Right, fairground. this will be in building 21 at seven o'clock. And Andy's gonna have a refractometer, right? So he can show you how to test for moisture. I don't know if Andy has one or not, but I'll have mine there. Okay. And that's Monday the 16th. And on Thursday the 19th, we have our Kansas Honey Producers Value Added Program by Zoom. And that'll be Rhea Carlton. And, and then also while I'm here, um, I'd encourage everybody to sign up to volunteer for the state fair. Um, it takes place in Hutchison, starts so. the week of Labor Day, and you can go to signupgenius.com and pick a volunteer slot to sign up in and volunteer in our honey booth. And there's a link on the kansashoneyproducers.org website for the Sign Up Genius. And you can, that's great because you can see who's, what slots are open or what slots have already been filled. And I'll have it in the newsletter as well. That's all exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to hear Rhea Carlson. Rhea is being brought to us by the Kansas Honey Producers. The Kansas Honey Producers is doing this. They're sponsoring it. Uh, so it's free to you. You do have to register, but then you get a link, like a Zoom link. Uh, she does apotherapy, bee sting therapy, but she also does pollen and propolis and all kinds of things the hive is a medicine cabinet so i'm i've heard her we've heard her speak before she's come to kansas before she's fun to listen to so i hope everybody will tune in she's she's a great gal so anything else for the good of the cause if not i bet robert i bet we're done we're at 801 yay